week on The Big Bite, we go in search of the computer pirates of Hong Kong. Computers in the schoolyard. Projects come to life with a little help from PCs. And unique users of internet. Join us as we journey into the gothic world of Cyberden. Tonight on the game segment, I'll be reviewing Jurassic Park. Hi there, Basha Bonkowski here. Good to see you again with The Big Bite. Also this week, we decide whether there really is any difference between Macintosh and Windows. Hong Kong is a place where you can buy just about anything, from French designer clothes to an armload of gold. I find video equipment from all around the world to pet birds with enough locusts to keep them singing forever. Hong Kong is also a huge centre for computer equipment, both hardware and software, and this is what increasingly attracts computer buffs wanting to stock up on the latest programs. bargains here but when it comes to computer software the markdowns are amazing but that's because they're pirated copies while it's very attractive to pay a fifth of the price the risks are becoming higher here and in other countries around the world the big companies losing billions are pushing for tougher laws and convictions in Taiwan, four recent cases of software piracy led to jail terms of between 18 months and four and a half years and in Australia recently, one of the country's biggest companies paid a heavy penalty when it was caught with pirated software. When we do catch people, we prosecute them to the fullest extent available under the law within that country. We have no qualms of sending people to prison, and that is actually our goal in each software piracy case. Ron Ekstrom is a Hong Kong-based lawyer who sues people right throughout Asia on behalf of the big software companies, who've joined together as the Business Software Alliance. His message is simple. It's not worth buying pirated copies. Well, again, the risk is going to be that you get a substandard software product that could destroy the files on your computer. Um, and you are breaking the law in almost every country in Asia and Australia. It is a criminal offense to use pirated software. Have ordinary people been prosecuted or have you, so far have you only prosecuted the people selling software? We generally do not prosecute individual users at the home level. However, anything above that we will prosecute. Simon Wong is another frontliner in the battle against piracy. With raids and prosecutions, he's contained the blatant copying that existed in Hong Kong four years ago. But, he says, the sheer ease of the operation and the amounts to be made ensure it will continue. We've been trying uh, very hard over the years to scam down all scale of uh, privacy or privating uh, activities. But obviously, because of the high profit margin attached to the selling of these infringing copies, uh, there are still those uh, hardcore, uh, very uh, persistent counterfeiters who are still engage in such kind of business. One of the problems with the genuine software suppliers is that they can't ever hope to compete with the pirated copies. This is one of a chain of stores that estimates it loses around 5 million US a year in potential sales. But that's nothing compared to the combined losses in countries around the world. Software piracy around the world is very, very high. I think if we averaged it out, we would probably come out with a figure like something around 70% of all software in use around the world is pirated. If we look at Asia, we're looking at figures between 90 and 99%, depending on the country. If we look at Australia and New Zealand, we're looking at between 45 and 50%. Surprisingly, for software that has the potential to land you in jail, it's very easy to find. Ask any taxi driver. You know where I can find cheap computer software? Golden software, okay? Thank you. On the back streets of Kowloon is one of many pirate operations in Asia. 
the basement of the Golden Computer Center is an Aladdin's cave. You can find any sort of computer program you want, from the real thing to a pirated copy that they'll run off for you in just 15 minutes. <laughs> No stop. So we're doing. What? what? We're doing. Hello. Hello. We're doing a story about uh, software, about computers. No. The Golden Shopping Arcade is raided about 60 times a year, but each time the stalls spring up again. We should say that not every stall in the basement is selling pirated software, but it's not hard to pick who is. We can film the hardware, yeah. and why not the not the software? Is it Oh, it's illegal. Yeah. Oh. The gold arcade has become synonymous in Asia as what's wrong with the enforcement of software copyright laws. Because no matter how hard the government here in Hong Kong goes out and conducts raids on our behalf, it has had no measurable effect on reducing the level of software piracy in the Golden Arcade. And in every major Asian city there is a golden arcade. For example, in Thailand there's Panta Plaza, in Jakarta is Marvin Krong, in Singapore it's Klong Plaza. They're exactly the same as a golden arcade and we routinely conduct raids against them and although they are less obvious than they were a few years ago, it's still very easy to obtain copied software. companies estimate they lose a staggering 15 billion US dollars a year through piracy. One of the problems, they say, is that many people don't view piracy as a crime. I think it's a fallacy to think that software companies are rich and exploiting and exploitive of, of their users. It costs millions, sometimes hundreds of millions of dollars to develop a single software program and those costs have to be distributed amongst all users. And if half of the people aren't paying for it, those people that are paying for the software are ending up paying a much higher price than they would if everyone was abiding by the laws and paying for what they were using. I think piracy will always be around. However, I don't think it'll stay at the high levels that we presently see in Asia and Australia. Because in order for these countries to develop, they will have to have a stronger commitment to reducing the level of software piracy because it has a direct effect upon the development of their own high-tech industry. Well, there's no doubt that interactivity and multimedia have a very important role to play in the classroom. Some teachers, though, are a little concerned that students like these two might spend too much time watching and not enough time doing, thus affecting their learning. That's an issue that's being addressed in a rather unique way by a program here in the UK called Project Horizon. Information technology itself is not really a subject anymore. It is merely a box of tools which can be used appropriately to support teaching and learning in all areas of the curriculum. In the Horizon project, I think you will find examples from every area of the curriculum, from areas as diverse as maths, French, modern languages, design technology and so on. And this is a project where pupils actually have the opportunity to capture okay. video and sound as well as text and graphics to make their own presentations, to present the information they've gathered in as a professional a way as a television or multimedia company might actually produce themselves. It's more fun to do it on the computer because you can make it how you want to make it look and if you try something and it doesn't look right you can change it and you can also put pictures and drawings and, and sound. We recorded the sounds and then we got the files and transferred them into Genesis and you can make all sorts of different sounds and sound of a bell I think here. <coughs> to start off with it's a bit like, oh no, what, what do we do now? But once you know what you're doing, it's very easy. The Horizon Project has been an incredibly powerful medium. It's given us, in school, a reason to actually start reading the manuals and start working with the children using the Acorn computers. 
to their limit. Whereas before the project, we just did a bit of simple word processing, a bit of simple database work. It's given us an excuse, if you like, to actually work very hard to produce good applications. And the most pleasing thing is that the skills are transferable. So the fact they have to plan their computer page very, very carefully and measure it up and align the frames and make sure it's got a good balanced look, those skills are then reflected in their written work and are, are truly transferable. I think in a relatively short period of time, we're going to find interactive multimedia in their homes. And we need, if you like, to train, to educate a generation to handle that sensibly. So it doesn't all become just non-stop, put the head on the cartoon, but it's actually increasing their knowledge and increasing their view of the world. In primary schools, many of the traditional skills are taught within the framework of a class project. So too is the awareness and the use of information technology. Do you like milk, white or plain? Try and put that into the mouth. After a visit to a local chocolate manufacturer, these children in Warwick decided to produce and market their own chocolates within the school. Then they used information technology to design promotional materials, posters and packaging. The project reflects the way many professional products are actually designed and marketed. The only difference is that here at Warwick School they did all this as part of the normal curriculum activities. Nowadays, when children go to school, they enter a world very different from that of their parents. The fear of computers is unknown to this generation, and children will be prepared to enter this new age of technology. The vast array of computer software available bewilders most of us. The simple reason for this complexity is the amount of money at stake, yours. When one product does well, naturally enough, other companies copy it, which has understandably resulted in bitter legal battles. When Microsoft released Windows to make Intel-based computers as easy to use as Apple's Macintosh, Apple had that company in court claiming copyright infringement. Ironically, the very basis of these systems, the friendly graphical user interface, was actually invented years ago by Xerox. Windows has given Microsoft a very powerful lead in the market to the extent that many of its competitors claim it has an unfair monopoly. New operating systems such as Solaris, Pink and Workplace OS will be appearing very soon, hoping to compete with Windows and the Macintosh. Expect to hear of a fresh raft of legal battles as well. To the consumer, the differences between these systems are simply minor annoyances. But to computer companies, they are weapons in a life and death struggle for our dollar. Only a decade ago, the idea of communicating with people using a computer was almost unheard of. Today, internet connects the world and provides an indescribable amount of information to millions. It's all about people and their computers, and the discussion topics are as varied as the people themselves. Everything from business, schoolwork, stamp collecting, how to make an apple pie, to a group of musicians who make up the Cyber Den. Peter Stone is the system operator of the Cyber Den, a bulletin board set up for musicians and fans of gothic industrialized music. Its many features include band reviews, sound sampling, CD labels, and electronic communication. Right now, the Cyberdyne has been up for about a month. We have about a thousand users, and that ranges from everybody to bands, record companies, magazines, people that are just involved in the, the music scene by going to clubs or being in the fashion. And they all use the Cyberdyne to let other users on the Cyberdyne and in the internet know about what they're doing, what their music sounds like, what their art looks like. For instance, what we have here is the Gothic and Dark Wave section. This pretty much is about the entire Gothic movement, the music, the fashion, the pictures, there's poetry, there's short stories, reviews. Because the music itself is one thing, but the actual people, they're kind of a culture of their own. Tell me about some of the other features, because you've got a lot of stuff there. 
Yeah, the other features that we have, the Cyberlink area, you can actually download pictures of their latest CD. Really? Or you can download uh, actual minute of a song that they've done. Or it could be the a audio song. will actually come through. The audio will come through and you can uh, pull that up and listen to it. If you like it, you can write the band, you can write a record label that is online telling them, yeah, you should listen to this band. We have a cyber info area, which lists out various areas of uh, information, like I've got specs and information on MIDI and studio gear equipment. There's another uh, entity that's on the cyber den, and it's a magazine that you can download and pretty much look yourself on your own computer what they're up to. In fact, a lot of the users that use the Cyberden uh, also frequent a club called House of Usher. And they're using the Cyberden now to interact with users online to tell them that they have a new album out or that they, uh, they're here to talk to. If you want to start a fan club, they can do that now. And uh, record companies can look at their work too. Uh, I never used a computer before Cyberden came along and, you know, being involved in the music industry as a record label, I felt it was a great resource. One of the users that we do have, his name's Desmond, and he's got this car with five aerials on it. He's got a live TCP IP network link straight into the internet. He's got two meter radios. Guy is insane. He's totally wired. So you're saying that you can actually call him up here in his car? We can call him right now. All we have to do is, is look over in the communication center and go over to uh, talk to a user, and if he's online, we'll see him, and there he is. Hello, Peter, and we can say hello back, and hello. This is Peter and Phil from the Big Bite. That's, yeah. a, that's a unique use of uh, internet, huh? Yeah, it's the first one I've heard. I've heard it being done on bikes before, but this is the first time I've heard it being done in a car. One of my missions in life is to get people as wired as possible and as interested in all of this great new technology as possible. People find it very prohibitive and they see these things as, as something that's just way beyond them. And it's really not. When you take a system like the cyber and you have people who would not normally be interested in online systems suddenly very excited about being in front of their computer. When choosing a computer, your decision may be influenced by how inviting the screen looks when you turn it on. Even as recently as a couple of years ago, many screens were plain or dark, which made computing both tedious and boring. Today, most computers come with a graphical user interface, or GUI. A GUI makes using a computer a whole lot easier by offering a face that is simple and fun to work with. Apple's Macintosh, with its amusing symbols and icons, was a winner from the start. Microsoft Windows was developed more recently for Intel-based or IBM-compatible computers to challenge the user-friendly Mac. Nowadays, almost 80% of PCs use Windows software. So, how do you decide which interface is best for you? Let's have a look at what makes Macintosh and Windows different. Both have loyal fans, and I know which one I'm loyal to, who say that changing to the other takes a bit of getting used to. The truth is they're really quite similar. Both of them allow you to work on more than one file at once, two make your file windows bigger or smaller, and both have pull-down menus. However, there are a number of significant differences. If you want to find a file on a Macintosh, then open the folder they're in and they'll appear on the screen in front of you. Exactly the same feature is available in Windows, but you'll first have to use the File Manager. Deleting a Windows file is a basic menu operation and a lot less satisfying than the Macintosh. As Mac files are dumped, the trash actually gets fatter, telling you it needs to be emptied. If your desk tends to get very messy, you'll appreciate the way Windows lets you do everything with a keyboard so you don't have to hunt round for the mouse. You'll find the key commands on the drop-down menus. Intel-based or IBM-compatible computers come with a more versatile keyboard. For example, you can delete characters from either side of the cursor. And if you want a break from serious computing on Windows, you can always relax with its built-in solitaire and practice your mousing while you're at it. The Macintosh GUI is stylish, has matured over its 10 years, and all the software works in the same way. Windows is inexpensive, runs on a wide range of hardware, and the amount of software available means it's versatile. So the decision ultimately comes down to personal choice, whatever turns you on. The best thing to do is try out both GUIs, then decide which one you feel most comfortable with. What's that noise?
Hi, I'm Hayden. I'm the games reporter for The Big Bite, and I've got this big thing on my head to test the games so you can see exactly how I'm playing and what's happening on the screen. OK, now this week we're going to test Jurassic Park, which was released a few months after the movie. The, it's an, a simple platform game, which they whipped up pretty quickly uh, right after the release of the movie maybe just before and uh, certainly you can see that because it's not a very complex game it doesn't require much thinking at all uh, but the graphics are very very good especially for the dinosaur that's another thing you can choose between being Sam Neill his name's Grant or the dinosaur and uh, well I think the dinosaur is best and a lot of people too because you can kill a lot more things when you're Sam Neill all you can do is just tranquilize him anyway uh, yeah that's a good thing about it and Sam Neill can choose different weapons the graphics are very realistic they're taken straight from the movie being digitized and the sound also i think is good as you can hear uh, especially the, the screams of the dinosaurs and the men which you kill it's an easy game to play because it's so simple and um that's one of the bad things about it too but because uh, it, it tends to wear off after a whole day of playing so um it's okay value for the money you pay but it won't be very expensive for uh, very long because it's a new release so i'd give it about a five out of ten i'm hayden see ya